Welcome to the Halbrom Department of Population and Family Health's Fall 2020 Seminar Series. This week's seminar, entitled Rethinking Race Among Adolescents in a Multiracial Generation, an Emerging Research and Public Health Approach to Identity and Health, is with Dr. Stephanie Grillo, Assistant Professor of Population and Family Health. Um, thank you all for joining um, the Population and Family Health Fall 2020 Seminar Series. Our seminar today is with Dr. Stephanie Grillo on Rethinking Race Among Adolescents in a Multiracial Generation and Emerging Research and Public Health Approach to Identity and Health. Stephanie Grillo, PhD, whose pronouns are she, her, hers, is an assistant professor in the Halbroom Department of Population and Family Health at the Mailman School of Public Health. Dr. Gurlow is a social scientist and public health researcher whose research area of interest focuses on adolescent health globally and domestically and emphasizes the need for taking a resiliency approach to improving health outcomes for vulnerable populations. This includes work on understanding multiracial identity, formation and the influence on health outcomes, adolescent preventive services, comprehensive sexual health education, and its role on preventing in preventing sexual assault, pregnancy outcomes for young women of color, as well as global research on fertility decision making in areas of high HIV prevalence. Dr. Grillo co teaches qualitative methods in the core curriculum, as well as in the population and family health department. Dr. Grillo is also the co founder of Mosaic, which is mentoring of students in Igniting Community, a faculty and student mentorship community for first generations and students of color in the department. We're very excited to, to have Dr. Grillo here for this seminar. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna pass it off to her. Thank you. Thank you, Lizzie, for that introduction. And thank you everyone for um, coming today and being here. I'm very excited to present to you some of my work on um, multiracial adolescents and young adults and identity development. So I will share my screen um, and please feel free to interrupt me while I'm, um, while I'm talking. You can either unmute yourself and, um, and ask your question or you can uh, put it in the chat and Lizzie's going to help me uh, make sure that I don't miss any chats, but please feel free. We'll also have plenty of time at the end uh, for questions, but please feel free to interrupt me if you have questions while I'm talking. Okay. Make sure you can see this. Okay. Lizzie, can you see my screen? Yes. Yep. Let's okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. So I could um, I could start by presenting um, numbers to all of you to highlight the importance of studying and understanding the multiracial population in the United States. But I decided I thought it would be more powerful to show you and let you hear from people who identify as multiracial instead to kick off this conversation. Uh, these quotes and photos I think demonstrate really the importance of uh, the impact of this research that the research can have um, on the future, on real uh, people and their lives and their families, and also uh, necessitates the need for future qualitative work on the subject. So you can see I take a, a mixed methods approach, um, and I think this is really critical. So I found these quotes. Um, these are not from my own research. These are from uh, popular media and books and uh, quotes from interviews. But I think that each of the quotes I'm going to show you highlights a unique perspective um, and links to an area that I'll discuss further in my presentation. So this first one says, being multiracial is a blessing. It's a love of two people from different cultures and perspectives that collides to add understanding, tolerance, and beauty to a chaotic world. Uh, so again, this sort of takes the more positive, affirming view here about interracial relationships, families, and identity. And this is going to be a theme that I really come back to multiple times throughout this presentation. I think uh, too often, uh, public health research, but especially research on identity, race, ethnicity, takes a, um, a really risk-based framework and sort of assumes, um, assumes risk for populations that often um, uh, don't assume, don't uh, sort of take on that risk as part of their own identity, and often the data don't bear that um, type of risk-based approach out, which I hope to show you today, but I think that this is a, an, a, an excerpt that sort of begins to move us in that direction. So here's the second quote. Uh, when there's a gap between your face and your race, between the baby and the mother, between your body and yourself, you're expected everywhere you go to explain the gap. 
Um, this, I think, uh, really highlights the importance of outside perception of identification and the influence that that has, right? So uh, when someone, uh, we'll talk a lot and I'll sort of define uh, the differences between um, identity categorization and identification because they're really very critical differences. Uh, but I think this is one of um, the, the sort of instances when uh, your own identity or the identity of your family doesn't necessarily match uh, people's um, sort of frames or categories that they have in their head and the real harm that that can have on individuals when that's projected outward and you're asked constantly to explain why something doesn't map on to someone else's um, official categorization or the way that they view race or ethnicity, especially in the United States. So here's the third excerpt. So this says, I saw her note the way I hovered over the various, various ethnicities on the form, first the white box, then to the airspace over the black box, a kind of momentary hesitation, a protest of stillness, a staring into the abyss of everything I did not know about myself. She, like me, was made of tabs. Um, and then uh, there's a picture here, which I'll get back to as well, from the census form asking people to fill out their race and ethnicity. And I think this highlights the importance and impact of official categorization, which is again, something I'm going to come back to uh, later in the presentation. But when we force people into boxes, uh, the sort of uh, real impact that that has on people as they go to select which box they're going to pick or what they can pick on a, on a given day and how that potentially changes over the life course, uh, but also um, sort of the impact it even has in the moment of having to select uh, select one or the other or both. And then finally, um, a picture of Barack Obama and a quote that he said once, I self-identify as African-American, that's how I'm treated and that's how I'm viewed, I'm proud of it. And I think um, this has uh, sort of multiple implications, but one is that not everybody with mixed ancestry necessarily identifies or categorizes themselves as multiracial and how it's really important um, that we sort of uh, allow people to identify um, as they choose. And it also highlights, uh, I think he's highlighting here, uh, the impact of other people's perception and treatment um, on how he identifies himself. So again, these are just four examples. We'll come back to all of them throughout the presentation. So here is a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'm, I'll begin by sort of highlighting uh, the major gaps in the literature, uh, provide some background information on the multiple literatures. You'll see quickly that I'm pulling from a couple of different literatures and bodies of literature that often don't speak to one another. So I'll cover a little bit of background on those main literatures that I'm pulling from. Talk briefly about the changing demographics in the United States and why this is a critical uh, area of research to be focused on. I'll talk through two empirical papers that I'm working on that look at multiracial data. One comes from the panel study of income dynamics, and one comes from data with um, Dr. Sandeli and Dr. Katalasi using the Adolescent Health Consortium data. And then I'll talk a little bit through implications, uh, future research, and then hopefully we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion as well. Okay, so first is, um, I'll begin by sort of highlighting uh, the importance of looking at this topic specifically within adolescents and young adults, because of course uh, you can study multiracial identity sort of at any um, at any age, but I think it's really important in terms of the developmental period that we're looking at, because adolescents and young adults are going through sort of these multiple different types of develop development, right? They're going through cognitive development, physical development, and social and emotional de development, and all of these have implications for how they identify. Um, especially in terms of their race and ethnicity, but you'll see we don't only look at race and ethnicity, there's also many other intersecting influences on young people's lives. And so as they're sort of going on these, uh, going through these different developments, it's really important to look at multiracial identity sort of within this life course framework, because when you look at the literature on adolescent development and the trans this transition from childhood to adulthood to uh, sort of emerging adulthood, I would say, it demonstrates really the importance of parent, sibling, um, other relationships, as well as extra familial relationships like peers and romantic partners. So that's, again, something I'll come to later in one of the empirical papers. But really, we've seen that racial and ethnic identity development is impacted by the developmental process and simultaneously is impacting the developmental process, right? So it's sort of this two-way pathway. And again, race and ethnicity are not going to be the only factors that impact identity formation during this period of development which is why in much of my research, I try to take an intersectional 
framework to be able to look at sort of how all of the different intersecting influences are impacting someone's adolescent and young adult, adult development and importantly, their identity development as well. So uh, I want to really understand sort of the impact of um, intersectionality on this identity process. And race and ethnicity, again, is one piece of this identity development. But there's other factors like gender, family, peer and sexual networks, geography, and, and socioeconomic status. So for example, uh, most of my work, especially on multiracial adolescents and young adults, focuses in the United States. But uh, the United States is a, is a very unique context for race and ethnicity, as all of us know. Uh, so if, if you look at this process or this um, this type of research in other places, it might look very, very different. And I think it's important to, to keep that in mind. But even within the United States, as we've seen over the last couple of weeks, uh, importantly, the election, um, ge geographic region in the United States differs tremendously, too. So the experience of young people uh, who identify as multiracial is potentially very different in a place like New York City than it is somewhere else in the country. So when we get to future research, I'll talk through some of my strategies for future research in what I'm uh, proposing and to, to try to sort of disentangle those experiences and the influence of geography on those experiences. And then of course, socioeconomic status as well. And I'll go, th go through some patterns we're seeing in terms of socioeconomic status and the correlation uh, between socioeconomic status and multiracial. There's a lot of research uh, that looks at some of these um, different factors on multiracial identification or really on race and ethnicity. Um, but there was a recent article by Davenport, and I can send it to anyone who's interested, that looks at the effects of gender, socioeconomic status, and religion um, on biracial identity. That's really interesting. And um, they sort of break down by biracial subgroups. Um, and they look at economic influence, for example, economic influence and Jewish identity predicted uh, white self-identification, whereas belonging to a religion commonly associated with racial minorities was associated with minority identification for people with mixed ancestry. Um, interestingly, gender was uh, the single best predictor of identification. So uh, biracial women were much more likely than biracial men to identify as, as multiracial. Um, and I think there's a lot of reasons that we could talk through probably for a while about why that might be the case. But um, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, perception by other people and treatment by other people um, and how that sort of relates to and impacts how someone self-identifies. So this is a model that I'm sure many of you are very familiar with. I won't stay on it for too long, uh, but sort of talks through the relationship between racism and health. This is from Clark and Williams in 1999. It's one of the most famous uh, race and health models of um, uh, how race impacts health outcomes. But again, it's really not race impacting health outcomes, it's racism. Um, and this sort of walks through how uh, the perception of an environmental stimulus uh, that could be perceived as racism impacts coping responses, psychological and physiological stress responses. And that really is the pathway between racism and health. And so I think that this is just an important frame to keep in mind as we think about all of the potential between uh, any type of identity, but especially especially race and ethnicity, um, and how uh, treatment from other people, perception of other people has a profound impact on people's stress response, psychological and physiological response, and eventually leads to poor health outcomes in some cases. Uh, before I move uh, on, I wanted to operationalize multiracial quickly because this, is, um, this could actually probably take up our whole time together, uh, but really it's, it's contextual. So I said this before, there's different definitions of race and ethnicity in the United States in comparison to elsewhere in the world, um, and really even within the United States. But race and ethnicity have sort of different formal definitions. So race generally refers to the categories black, white, Asian, um, and other. And ethnicity generally refers to national origin. So in many cases, forms just ask for things like Hispanic or not Hispanic. Um, mind you, there's a lot of research on the, the, the deep problems that exist within categories like this. Um, and how much work we have to do uh, to better uh, collect and measure this data, which is, again, what I'll come back to at the end in terms of what I hope my future research uh, will help to do. Um, there's even a tremendous amount of debate in the literature about the category Hispanic uh, versus Latino versus Latinx. Um, and if you look at Pew or if you look at the census, you can see even they uh, define and use those terms differently. Um, so in the case of my research, um, 
uh, the research that I'll present to you today is, both, is secondary data analysis. So they weren't categories that I had created myself. So we are using what's available to us. But um, just to briefly touch on this, um, so the Census Bureau generally uses the term Hispanic. Uh, Pew Research Center, which does a lot of demographic work, usually uses the term Hispanic and, and Latino interchangeably. Um, and, and some people criticize this because, for example, uh, many people say that Hispanics are people from Spain or from Spanish speaking countries, whereas um, uh, Latino is people from Latin America, regardless of language. So might include places like Brazil, whereas Hispanic would not include people from Brazil because they're not Spanish speaking. So it's a, it's a very complicated uh, measurement uh, problem. And I, I'll talk through this as well when we get to some of the empirical data, but um, uh, measurement problems are not small problems, right? Like these are, these are real people's identity and identification. And so when we ask questions that don't align with how people identify, is our data really actually meaningful? Um, is a question that I think about a lot. And you'll uh, hear me say that I receive a lot of pushback, especially when I try to publish a lot of this work, uh, because when you try to change categories um, that people are, are comfortable with, <laughs> Um, it's difficult because it's, they're really entrenched in uh, long, long term uh, sort of thoughts about race, racism, um, in the, especially in the United States. But uh, for the purpose of most of my work, um, I would say we include Hispanic or Latino in our in our categories of race, because someone who is uh, white and Hispanic or Latino probably has a very different experience than someone um, who is white and not Hispanic, for example. It also is important to note that the meaning of multiracial identification is really different for individuals depending on how salient the importance and, and the, and the racial and ethnic categories are for them. Uh, so for some people, it's uh, sort of front in their mind in terms of how they identify and others it's not, and we can talk about that. Um, and also in terms of how much distance there is between their different categories. So for example, being black and white in the United States might be very different than being Asian and white might be very different than being white and Hispanic. So in all cases where it's possible to disaggregate, instead of lumping all multiracial people into a group, which really doesn't make very much sense um, analytically or conceptually, trying to disaggregate between these different potential uh, groupings is really important. Okay, so these are some of the gaps in the literature. Uh, research into adolescent development, multiracial identity uh, formation, and health outcomes really exist in silos. And, um, I think it's important that we try to pull these different literatures together because they have they all have so much to uh, add and contribute. And I think look at these issues in very different ways, but the way that they're currently sort of presented in the literature, they don't really talk to one another. Uh, we really have an ina inadequate understanding of multiracial identities, and that's really led to invalid categories and potentially invalid measurement, which I just spoke about. Um, and then there's a large body of research that has looked at disparities by race and ethnicity which many of us are familiar with. Um, and there's really very little research that has examined health outcomes of multiracial populations. And those that do, uh, I think, take a, a, a very risk-based approach, which I've um, now said a couple of times, but I think is really important to interrogate um, and ask, ask questions of, because I'm not sure the, the sort of data, at least that I'm seeing, backs up a lot of that, uh, that risk-based approach and, and can potentially do a lot of harm. So just in terms of context, there really is an increasing multiracial population in the United States. So racial and ethnic intermarriage has been and continues to be on the rise. So in 1967, there was roughly 3% roughly of newlyweds were married to someone of a different race or ethnicity. Um, in 2015, that percentage was 17%. Um, and I'm highlighting this because it's a, it's a social trend, I think, that, that shows the increasing sort of mixing of multiple races, um, but also because it's just sort of one metric that's used to look at the increase of multiracial population. Um, of course, not all children are born as the product of a, of a marriage, but I think, again, it's an important social trend to be looking at uh, when studying this type of demographic question. And the graph on the right-hand side shows some of the sort of most common multiracial and multi-ethnic variations. So 42% uh, of that um, Seventeen percent of people that said that they were married to someone of the different race or ethnicity were white and Hispanic combination. Fifteen percent were white and Asian. Twelve percent were white and multiracial, and then eleven percent were white and black. And that, again, the, the numbers are there, but they get a little bit smaller as you go down. So again, this sort of 
uh, once again shows that multiracial isn't one category of people, right? It's made up of many different um, categories and combinations of races and ethnicities. Um, and there's, there's multiple factors that can point to why this is rising, legal changes in intermarriage. For example, uh, Loving versus Virginia, the court case in 1960, um, that uh, can't, every time I say this, can't believe that it was only in 1960 where uh, people from multiple races, different races were allowed uh, to get married. But um, that's just one of the many uh, things that have changed that have allowed contextual changes like this. Also, the reason that this title, this talk was called uh, allowed to be multiracial is when you look at the census categories over time, uh, there's important, there are important markers for sort of social transitions and tracking over time. So categorization shifts as social changes shift, right? So uh, multiracial identification was literally not allowed on the census until 2000. Um, so between 1790 and 1950, if you look at the census, uh, uh, the census directions, census takers actually decided the race of the people that they uh, what they were collecting. So when they would go to someone's house and get their information, they would ask race and ethnicity. They would just put whatever they thought the person was. Uh, so I think I don't need to go further into how problematic that was, but again, that, that was until 1950. So it was strictly based on phenotype. Uh, starting in 1960, this changed to self-enumeration. So this was the first time that someone could select their own race and ethnicity, but you had to select one. Uh, you were not allowed to select multiple races. And then finally, in 2000, so again, not very long ago, uh, you were able to select multiple races uh, for the first time. So really, before 2000, you weren't officially allowed to select multiple races. You had to pick uh, which one you wanted to identify with. And this one more time is just to remind us that, we're, that a lot of this work pulls on uh, different literature, so the sociological literature around multiracial identity formation, uh, identity and health, which often pulls from public health work, um, adolescent and young adult development, which a lot comes from the uh, medical literatures on adolescent development, and then importantly, historical context, because un unless we look at race, the history of race, racism, uh, since the census, et cetera, in the United States, it's really nearly impossible, I would say, to understand why and how people identify certain, way certain ways and how we can sort of tie those identifications into a larger societal context. Uh, one more thing in terms of, uh, in terms of definitions, um, the importance of understanding these different definitions and using them uh, critically um, is, is I, I, it, I don't think can be understated. So um, identity formation is used when addressing research that has been done looking at sort of the intrinsic process of forming one's identity, right? So identity formation is how I actually identify myself. Um, Racial, this is again very hard to measure or very hard in at least in demographic surveys to measure. Racial identification is when you rely on others' identification of an individual's uh, race or ethnicity. And then categorization, this is what's actually being measured in most studies that we look at, right? Not identity, but categorization. And categorization is uh, the way that someone identifies when they're forced into generally with a closed ended set of, set of categories. Um, which what they're going to identify with, right? So that's categorization. And uh, I think uh, one way that we can continue to push the field forward is to ask really critical questions when someone is presenting uh, data, which sort of which, uh, which of these processes are they looking at and what are they actually reporting on? So this is a conceptual framework that I have developed um, over time and most, much of my future research will hope to uh, break down these many different factors, because again, none of this could be looked at in one or even two um, studies. It really has to be looked at over time. Uh, but my, the empirical papers I'll present to you shortly um, begin to walk us through some of these. So again, this takes um, both a life course approach, as you can see on the bottom, in terms of looking at this really in adolescence and emerging adulthood. It also uses a social ecological framework to demonstrate that there's factors on the individual level, like gender, religion, internal stress, mental health, immigration status, phenotype, et cetera. There's factors on the interpersonal level, like family influences, primary language, parental education, peer influences, et cetera. There's factors on the community level, like geographic region, the percent poverty, percent race and ethnicity, percent foreign born, uh, sort of access to services. Those are factors on the community level. And then there's factors on the structural level, like racism, discrimination, segregation, immigration, 
gender and cultural norms and formal categorization. Sort of this whole confluence of factors on all of these different levels influence racial and ethnic identity formation in terms of how people identify themselves, both uh, either as single race identifying or as multiple races. Um, and then that also has an impact on health outcomes. But again, that's also a bi-directional uh, relationship. So this is a, a framework that I've developed sort of pulling in literature and data from multiple different sources and hope to begin to unpack further uh, with the work that I'm presenting to you today, but also with future, future research. So the first paper uh, that I'll present to you on uh, sort of begins to look at the sort of described patterns in demographic trends in multiracial adolescents and young adults, and then also explore um, parental influence and peer influences on multiracial populations. So this data comes from the panel study of income dynamics. Uh, really interestingly, they have a child development supplement. So the data is from 2014. And the structure of the data is that we have data from the primary caregiver and then also the child. And the child is um, ranged from 12 to 17 years old. So sort of middle, middle adolescent, middle to late adolescent. And this paper is under review at Health Psychology. Okay. So for this paper, um, this is how we had to uh, create our race and ethnic uh, groups. And once again, this is not perfect. Uh, there's a lot of different considerations that you have to take in when you're creating, uh, when you're creating analysis groups. Uh, the realities of sample size, as, although multiracial populations are growing in the United States, uh, they're still relatively small and I would say undersampled in national surveys. Um, there's conceptual realities of identification. So uh, I'll talk through why we made some, de some decisions to, on the left. And then there's historical and racial context and also really the important issue of reference groups. So I take it very seriously in my work that not all groups should be compared to white single race uh, adolescents or young adults, or in any case, any sort of white single race group, because I think, the, I think it sort of reifies the belief that white is the uh, is the model or the reference that everyone should be compared against. So um, I, I pay very much attention, very close attention to which sort of who is the reference group for what group and how does that conceptually make sense, not just in, not just empirically make sense. So for this, we had white single race, black single race, Asian single race, Hispanic single race, white multiracial, black multiracial, and other. So black multiracial means that someone identified as black and any other race, racial group, white multiracial is everyone else who identified as two that did not include black. Um, and that's for a couple of different reasons, again, that could take up probably our whole time together, but um, many adolescents and young adults who are uh, identify as black and another racial or ethnic group say that the way that they are perceived, no matter how they identify in the United States is black. Um, and that again is because of the historical and racial order context in this country, uh, the one drop rule, um, and many other sort of uh, ways that the United States has reified phenotypes um, in this country. So uh, because of sort of the reality of the, and the importance of the identification from other people, uh, we thought it was uh, prudent that the black multiracial subgroup was separated out from those who are multiracial, but that that identity didn't include black. So first, uh, these are just some demographics that we thought were interesting. So uh, you can see here, there's uh, some level of socioeconomic disadvantage among multiracial families. Um, so if you look at white single race, they had the highest mean income. White multiracial families reported a, a lower mean income than their white single race peers. And then for black multiracial families, they also reported a lower mean income than their black single race peers. Interestingly, when you look at the percent urbanicity, both white multiracial uh, and black multiracial had higher percentages of um, living in urban areas than their single race peers. I think that um, this potentially has to do with acceptance of multiracial identity in urban areas being greater than uh, in, in rural or suburban areas. Uh, but it's interesting that for both white multiracial and black multiracial in comparison to their single race peers, this percentage was this percentage was higher. So this table shows the identification of parents and adolescents. This is important for both empirical and conceptual reasons, but um, oftentimes, unfortunately, adolescents aren't asked directly questions about themselves, which um, Dr. Santelli is on the call, um, and he has written multiple papers about uh, why that's not, uh, not an accurate thing to do, because adolescents are report very accurately on their own data. 
and should be trusted to report on their own data. Uh, but here you can see the discrepancy between how a parent identifies their child and how the child identifies themselves. So if you look um, down in terms of rows, this is the mother's report of their child's race or ethnicity. And if you look across the columns, you'll see the child report. So in 38 cases, the, the mother reported that their child was uh, white and didn't select any other race or ethnicity group. Uh, however, the child reported white and an additional race and ethnicity group. So in 38 cases, um, they were discrepant, right? The parent and the child did not agree on their racial ethnic identification. And interestingly, the same goes for black single race. So 38 times uh, uh, the mother reported that their child was black and did not report a second identification for them. And the child reported uh, black and another race or ethnicity. So again, 0.76 is high for Cohen's Kappa, but many people would assume that this correlation would be, uh, that this sort of agreement rate would be close to 100%, and it really isn't. And if you look at father report, I didn't put it in here, but it looks almost identical. And the agreement rate between the mother and the father is uh, close to 100%. I think that, again, this can be for multiple reasons, but um, one is multiracial identification really, again, wasn't allowed quote, until uh, 2000. So often the, this generational difference between parents and, and their children is strong because for parents, um, this multiracial identity wasn't really something that was commonplace or that people uh, really asked or allowed you to focus on, whereas these children are growing up in a time where it's, it's at least a little bit more common. We also looked at uh, psychological, um, different psychological scales. So one was depressive symptoms. Um, and again, this comes back to the point I was making very early on, which is people sort of assume risk in this population. Uh, some of that risk they uh, in the literature says, you know, if, if someone identifies as multiple uh, races or ethnicities at this already sort of turbulent time of adolescence and young adulthood, uh, will they be sort of more at risk uh, for, for things like depressive symptoms um, because they don't necessarily fit into a traditional category um, or because their peer groups um, are more fractured because, because of these sort of multiple identities, which again, really is not what I'm finding at all. So in this case, um, in terms of the depression inventory short form, uh, black multiracial youth actually reported significantly lower uh, scores for depressive symptoms, and this is even after your con after we controlled for um, controlled for income. This was uh, looking at peer victimization and bullying. So again, there's a lot of focus on peer groups and the difficulty that people would have um, being multiracial. This is an interesting sort of picture. It's not. It's definitely not a perfect continuum. So uh, for white multiracial youth. Um, they report significantly higher rates of peer victimization and bullying than their white single race peers. But for black multiracial youth, uh, they report lower, not significantly so, but lower, um, lower peer victimization and bullying scores in comparison to their black single race peers. I think this is important for a couple of reasons. One is that, again, it shows the importance of that this category of multiracial is not uh, a monolithic category, right? When you break it down further, you see these differences begin to emerge between different combinations of racial and ethnic groups. I think the other important thing here is really the sort of uh, very upsetting uh, but persistent finding that uh, sort of the, the white uh, majority group is, um, is sort of the, the, the group that has the least uh, sort of difficulty with things like peer victimization and bullying in, a lot when com in comparison to their uh, non-white peers. Um, especially when you look at the sort of difference between white and white multiracial, um, white multiracial youth. Then we looked at peer influences, both positive and negative. And this was interesting because a lot of the literature, again, that takes a really risk-based approach says that uh, peer behavior and peer groups are going to be riskier for multiracial youth because they'll be trying to sort of like fit in more with groups that they don't necessarily feel like they naturally fit into which is again, not at all borne out in the data that we're looking at. There really were no significant differences. Uh, these are, this is between the overall sample, black single race and black multiracial youth. We have the same uh, graph that I didn't put in here for the sake of time, um, uh, looking at white single race and white multiracial. And we see the same, we see the same patterns there as well. And then this is negative peer group behaviors. Again, we don't see any significant differences between uh, black single race and black multiracial uh, in terms of uh, peer group behavior. So this is them uh, 
reporting the percent of most or all of their friends engaging in these different behaviors. And in fact, uh, although not significant, Black multiracial youth uh, reported sort of the lowest uh, the lowest percentages in all of these different categories. And then finally, um, just to once again say the importance of looking at resiliency um, and not risk, uh, Black multiracial and Black single race adolescents in this sample had the highest percentages of self-esteem uh, scores. And this is something that has been previously found and reported on in psychological in different psychological studies and journals. However, I don't think is necessarily harnessed or focused on in a really risk-based framework that's often uh, how public health presents a lot of this data. Um, and I think, importantly, this needs to be sort of front and center and harnessed uh, when we're saying that even regardless of, even in the midst of uh, discrimination, racism, um, and, and sometimes poor treatment, the self-esteem scores for Black multiracial and Black single race adolescents and young adults are actually higher or at least on par with um, their white single race and white multiracial peers. So now um, I know we're getting to the time when we should move on to questions. So I'll try to go through this quickly. This is a second empirical paper that uses data from the Adolescent Health Consortium. Um, but this is really looking at, uh, looking at these sort of relationships between identification and health indicators. And this comes again from the Adolescent Health Consortium, uh, which look at, looks at a sort of wider range of adolescents age groups, so from 13 to 24. This was an interesting demographic finding that showed that both white multiracial and black multiracial reported higher percentages of um, not straight or unsure than their single race peers when asked about um, their sexual orientation. Um, one possible explanation here is that this group of people, again, is tends to be much younger than, so they're on the sort of younger side of the um, 13 to 24 year olds. Um, so they're also growing up not only in a generation that um, sort of is more fluid in terms of race and ethnicity, but also in terms of sexuality and gender. And then here, uh, just to say again, when we looked at alcohol use, tobacco use, and ever having sex, there were no significant differences between uh, Black multiracial in comparison to Black single race peers, and no significant differences between white multiracial in comparison to white single race peers. So once again, if you look at the reference groups, um, I think this is a much more accurate way of um, comparing and looking at this data. Um, and even when you look at all of the uh, race ethnicity groups that we had in the in the sample, there's no significant differences for multiracial adolescents in comparison to single race or to their other multiracial peers. Um, the pushback we get on this paper is that the sample size is, um, is small, which is true, it is. Um, but again, uh, the literature really doesn't follow um, any of the, any of this sort of more nuanced look at, at multiracial identity and how it's important not to, not to sort of paint these really broad uh, brushes of populations, especially uh, for young people. So um, some of these contributions are that research demonstrates that demographic changes are taking place in the United States. It's critical that public health research um, be doesn't sort of get left behind these demographic changes and continue to use frameworks and data that don't match uh, people's actual identification. It's interesting because sometimes in conversations when I say things like I think we need to change how we um, we measure race and ethnicity or we look at race and ethnicity, people push back and say, well, then you can't compare over time, uh, which I think is an interesting um, and frustrating response because why are we comparing over time things that don't actually um, don't actually relate to people's actual identification, right? Just because there's data doesn't mean it's good data or that it actually shows us anything of, of meaning or value. Um, the introduction of the empirical uh, testable framework I showed you, which provides um, a lens with which to approach multiracial identity and health and behavior outcomes. Uh, thirdly, the self-identification of racial and ethnic identity, particularly for youth, must be standard. So again, this comes back to the fact that we shouldn't be asking parents to identify their children for us. We, as soon as they're um, adolescents and young adults, they really can identify um, themselves and that that's going to be much more accurate, uh, accurate data than relying on parental identification. And then finally, that a strength-based approach and resiliency approach will yield a more accurate depiction of the lived experiences of multiracial youth um, instead of the historically produced risk-based narrative that exists and often is perpetuated um, by health disparities research. <clears throat> 
So I just bring us back to uh, this framework and that I hope to continue my research in many of these different areas. Um, a couple of things that I um, have proposed and are um, will hopefully get started soon, um, some qualitative work uh, with multiracial um, adolescents and young adults. Um, I hope to be, sort of begin to walk through this framework that um, I've created with them and ask about sort of the influences on their racial and ethnic identity and identification and also really critically how they would want to identify or want to be asked if they had to categorize their race and ethnicity so that we can begin to build better uh, and more accurate measures for national data sets uh, and for things like the census. I hope to also look at other quantitative data sets um, like birth certificate data, additional census data. I've already started looking at the National Survey of Family Growth. And then eventually I think it would also be interesting to look at comparative international data sets because as I mentioned earlier, uh, this work has been done in the United States, but really differs based on where you are in the world. And then I hope to use a lot of the formative research and the qualitative and quantitative data that I've been looking at to begin to build uh, new and better survey instruments that uh, will actually uh, reflect how people identify and their lived experiences. So with that, I would love to answer any uh, questions or have a, I think we have like 10 minutes or so for a discussion if anyone has questions. Jeff, I think that we have um, a question from um, our department chair, Terry McGovern. Oh. Less of a, less of a question, more of an apology, <laughs> Professor Grillo. I was on a donor call <laughs> and we were presenting and it went over. Um, no so worries. I have lost the opportunity to introduce you. That was an excellent <laughs> presentation and um, Thank you. super, super innovative and I uh, see so many different directions that your work can go in. It's very exciting. So I am not gonna ask you a question. I'm gonna let others <laughs> say hello and congratulate. Thank you, thank you very much. Sally, I think you have your hand raised. Uh, yeah, I do. Hi, Professor Grillo. Sure. Um, hello. I I have a quick question, um, I guess, just about like the last point that you were saying on like mm -hmm. um, comparing with global data. Um, and mm -hmm. I know like the idea of race and how race is viewed is very different in different parts around the mm -hmm. world. So could you like touch more on like how you would choose what global data to compare with? That's a great question. I think there's so many. I think you bring up an excellent point, which is I think that this work would look very different depending on where you do it. Um, I think my uh, sort of the most uh, a lot of people in this field uh, look next to Brazil um, to do a lot of this work because Brazil has a very complicated multiracial, well, racial uh, and sort of multiracial population. Um, and the way that they look at race and ethnicity is in some ways very similar to the United States in terms of uh, it being problematic. Um, and so I think the next step would probably be looking, um, looking at a place like Brazil where especially this, this multiracial population in Brazil is much larger than it is in the United States, um, but they don't necessarily view it as, um, view the category as multiracial. So I think it would be complicated in some ways, but potentially very interesting. So I think that that might be um, the next step, but I think really we could look at it, uh, we could look at this issue in many different places. I know in the United Kingdom, there's some work being done on multiracial populations as well. Um, that again, the history of race and ethnicity uh, there is, is also very different than it is in the United States. So I think uh, your point is a good one, but I'm excited because I think there's a lot of different uh, possibilities. Thank you. Another question from um, Dr. Smari. Great. Hi, Dr. Grillo. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, of course. I have a couple questions. I'll try to be really brief. Uh, so mm -hmm. have you, you mentioned intersectionality, but I was curious if you're looking at how identification along other, you know, dimensions of identity influences um, multiracial identity, basically. I'm, I'm thinking specifically about some work I know from Australia where adolescent, like religious um, identification also mm -hmm tends to drive their racial ethnic identification. So it's just interesting to think about that from a intersectional standpoint and how that ultimately plays out um, in various outcomes. And then the second question is whether you think that um, the census should approach measuring multiracial in any sort of different way, or are you content with the current way that it's done? Things like that. Thank yeah. you. 
Oh, of course, both are um, great questions. So the first in terms of religion, I have started to look at it. I haven't looked at it um, empirically yet, but in the first paper that I spoke about um, where I introduced the, um, the framework, the multiracial identity framework, um, I have actually have a couple of sections in that paper about um, previous work that's been done on um, the impact of religion on young people's identity in general, but also on their racial and ethnic identity. Um, so in the United States, a lot of that uh, work focuses on, um, well, a couple of different things. One, the sort of, there's some work that looks at um, Muslim adolescents and young adults and the influence on their race and ethnicity, which um, we know is already complicated because of the poor categorization um, of many populations. Uh, but then also that there was a couple of studies that were done on biracial youth who, um, if they report that they're actively involved in a um, religion that is more traditionally for, uh, sort of populated by people of color, that they're more likely to actually identify not as biracial, but as um, by their sort of single race identification, um, either Black or Hispanic, for example. Um, so that's really interesting. I think can be definitely pulled apart pulled apart more empirically, but um, I definitely have seen sort of the rise of that work as well. And then your second question, uh, the census question, I think is a, is a good one. I would say I'm not, um, I'm definitely not happy with how the categories are now. I think it's complicated to figure out how best, I, I, I understand sort of the complexities of figuring out better categories. Um, I would say it's better than it was uh, in 2000 or before 2000 when people weren't even allowed to select multiple races. So I think that's a step in the right direction. I think a really problematic piece is for uh, people who identify as Hispanic or Latino that um, they really don't uh, often identify as a racial group and uh, what that does sort of for resource allocation, I think is problematic. Um, but I think part of my work, I hope, will be when I talk to and then eventually um, create better identification measures, hope to be able to make some recommendations that are sort of embedded within people's lived experience, because I think asking people sort of how they actually identify and would want to be asked to identify is um, at least a step in the right direction. Um, John says, public health research commonly disaggregates individuals by race and ethnicity, but is silent about the realities of racism. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, John, I appreciate the question. I think a couple of things. Um, they do sometimes disaggregate by race and ethnicity, but I think in, uh, in very broad ways. So um, I think some of my work pushes back on the fact that even in uh, creating sort of a, an other category or a multiracial category, that doesn't disaggregate further actually perpetuates uh, racism in a lot of ways uh, because it's sort of telling people that uh, their lived experiences are all uh, common enough that they should be sort of in one category when we see when you disaggregate the data even a little bit that that's really not the case. Um, and I think until we sort of really push back, I think public health has gotten used to the fact that I think that, you know, I hear this sort of common narrative like, you know, we're really good at, at measuring um, health disparities. And I, I'm really actually not even convinced that we are that good at doing that, um, especially if when you look at categories that are often lumped together. I think I've had a lot of conversations with people about how it's also really difficult when you identify as multiracial to look at data and constantly you see yourself in sort of an other category or in a category that um, that people just commonly ignore. So in conversations I'm in a lot, people will say like, okay, let's look at this data by race and ethnicity. And they'll say, let's look at black, white, um, let's look at black, white and uh, Asian. And sometimes they'll say Hispanic. Um, and then they say, you know, there was also a multiracial category, but it was pretty small. So we'll just, we'll just ignore that. And I think like the language of how you present people's identity and identifications to themselves is critical. Like in, even if you can't, even if you can't use the category because the sample is small, um, I think instead of saying like, oh, and then there's this other group of people that are really small, so we're going to ignore it. Like that itself is a dangerous, um, I think, framework and way to say something. So I think people need to be more thoughtful in how they present um, data. And just because it's quantitative data doesn't mean it's sort of devoid of people's lived experiences. People still make up the data that people are presenting. And so I think being more thoughtful in how we present this data is really important. And then I think 
not trying to separate data from its sort of contextual um, contextual home. So that's why in a lot of the work I do, I try to sort of bring in the historical and sociological literatures because they they have sort of a, the, the data is dependent on that context. And I think when we take it out of that context, it becomes harder to understand and also harder to talk about. Are there any other questions? No? Well, thank you for coming, everyone. And yeah, with no other questions, I don't know if, if Professor McGovern wants to um, say the final couple words. No, no, thank you. I mean, I, sure, thank you. I think um, it's very, very exciting uh, that you are, you know, kind of deconstructing all of this. Um, and uh, I really, really look forward to uh, all of these lines of research that you've described. So congratulations on a great talk.